That's the best mathematical estimate under a lot of assumptions. But here what we're going to do is we're going to sample probability P1 and sample probability P2. So this thing here might be estimated to have a probability of 0.6. Not likely. It might have a probability very near zero or somewhere in between more often. And this one here might have a very low probability or a very high one. So on average, this one is going to have a higher sampled probability than the other one. And so in this algorithm, we're going to pick that first kind of squatty one in, that's in the middle more often than the other, but neither will be totally excluded. So there you go. Uh, this is a thing called Thompson sampling. It was invented in 1933 for no good reason because they didn't have computers back then. And just in the last two or three years, it's exploded because people have shown that the rate at which this learns, this is not quite the best algorithm. It's the best simple algorithm. It's almost as simple as this other algorithm, the Bayesian Bandit. And the Bayesian Bandit outdoes the best algorithms known and certainly the best simple ones. So it's really cool. So let's talk about this in real time. Uh, so we can encode the distribution by sampling. That's the idea there, is that if we have all these deterministic things, and I can't tell you I'm probably going to show you this ad, or I'm probably going to show you this version of it, and then give, ask you to give me something back. I have to concretify that and make some decision. So I'm going to sample, then do a deterministic thing, like you do a deterministic thing. I'm going to record that result, and then I'm going to make adjusted distributional type estimates and go on there. And this is an interesting thing. But sampling here lets us unify determinism and non-deterministic computation. And so the idea then, and oddly enough, the, uh, the little, there we go. So we have an RPC to the model selector. We have an RPC to the conversion detector. The training goes to the models, and the model selector asks the models for RPC results. And you can see now that we really only need about 10 lines of code to solve that problem using the Thompson sampling and a good real-time layer versus a lot of code with other frameworks. So this is work in progress. And I'd love to work with people on it. Uh, it's all on GitHub, both the aggregation stuff and the Bayesian Bandit stuff. And the slides are available online as well. Are there any questions? And I'm sorry, I noticed the, the, the inherent style mismatch here. He uses a black background, I used a white. What can I say? <laughs> He's cooler. And he works in San Francisco. So are there any questions other than just people taking pictures of slides that they can download <laughs> very shortly anyway? <laughs> yes, in the back. Uh, I'm not familiar with MapRs on super files. How similar is it to other real-time distributed file systems like Lustre? Oh, it's, it's much better. I mean, <laughs> uh, I don't have my big red hat on, but uh, but if we were to go to that web page, you'd see a picture of the hat uh, that I wear at all my uh, events. The, uh, the difference is this is really a Hadoop distribution. It's being abused in this slideshow as a persistence layer. But the, the file system is a POSIX-ish file system that maintains the replication uh, advantages of HDFS but gives you traditional file system semantics. And I say POSIX-ish in that you don't have some of the uh, ability to read from a file that's been deleted that you get in true POSIX semantics, but that you lose in all of the common POSIX-ish implementations like NFS. So it gives you HDFS API. It gives you NFS access. And it gives you the secret API as well. Uh, and it gives you guarantees about if you sync it, it goes to disk before it comes back. Or, as you like, goes to replicated memory before it comes back. And others can read it immediately. It gives you guarantees that all operations, reads and writes, have an order if they affect the same bytes in a file. 
And those guarantees are really critical if you're trying to build a system that does more than Hadoop. Hadoop file system does a reasonable job for Hadoop, generally, you know, at some performance loss, but does not do a job for anything else. Almost all of the other large-scale file systems, like you mentioned Luster and Gluster and Ceph, were designed with HPCC in mind. And they were not designed with replication uh, or very large uh, programs like uh, Hadoop programs in mind. And so they do a very poor job of certain things, notably failure tolerance in very, very large clusters. Because they don't replicate, because it used to be the disks were expensive and they, as a fraction of the bytes, failed less. We now have enormous clusters, they fail a lot. You know, how many today? Not, did it fail? That sort of thing. And so it's designed in a new age for a new set of problems and a new set of design ratios. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, can you say you can actually do it on, on GitHub? I do. I'm just curious what that, like what your GitHub ID or? Well, uh, it's T. Dunning. Back to this slide. Uh, oops, sorry, not, not that slide. Uh, right here, if you click there. I'm, I'm T. Dunning on GitHub. D. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Dunning. Dunning. Just like the name on the right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like, like this. <laughs> uh, it's Ted Dunning like this. Uh, and so that's the GitHub ID. And it's called Storm Counts, imaginatively enough. You have a hand up. Yeah. yeah so um, for the, um, you mentioned you basically do logging to uh, MapRFS and to do recovery if a, if a bolt goes down. Right. So, um, so if you're doing that for like a large computation, how do you, how do you actually get the performance to read in the whole data set? Is that something where you're only reading in the past minute, or is it? Well, I, I try to avoid performance questions like that when I design things, but the the system will read a gigabyte or more per node per second, and so if you have dual 10 gigabit links, it'll use both of them. And so you'll get a gigabyte or more per node aggregate read bandwidth, even if it's non-local reading. So if you had to read something big and you had 100 nodes, like you know 10 gigabytes to, to restore memory, you'd be able to do that in a fraction of a second. So you, you can read it fast. In this design, I'm talking about reading tens of bytes. And in fact, I'm talking about reading nothing except for the expanded window case because it's all kept in memory until it's committed. And once it's committed, it's the job of the view layer, not the job of the real-time layer anymore. And so there's very simple guarantees there, and all you have to have is big enough counts. So the output there is smaller than the input. And generally, if the input's coming in really fast, you have bigger counts. So you get that compression. So, yes, sir, question? Yeah. Yes, sir. yeah. So I, I just hate questions like that, having to you know say, well, we can do this many gigabytes per second, and therefore we can make this happen. And, and it's always got this niggling feeling of maybe we can make that happen. So I always try to design away from those extremes myself. Sometimes you can't. And these guys often have to design for those extremes. Uh, but a lot of problems don't, even if they look like it. More? Do you have more questions? Yeah, in the back again. Uh, um, different topic this time. Um, obviously, that with, with, uh, uh, just acknowledging that you've got to read the lower counts instead if you lose your app. Why do you have a simple app-based system, so say version, version on your tuples or your transactions? I probably could have done that in here, but literally it's consecutive lines. 